Good evening, everyone. So nice to have a crowd on a beautiful evening. That means the, our guest is a big draw. Um, I'm Gary Hildebrand, the Hornbeck Professor in Practice and Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture. It's my great honor to welcome our dear friend Garnett Cadigan for his talk entitled, The Ground is All Memoranda, Walking as Register, Responsibility, and Reenchantment. It's a delicious title. Let me begin with Garnett's version of our land acknowledgement. To walk, stand, sit, or lie on any land is to be on a landscape layered with histories, memories, possibilities realized and denied, and stories that demand to be acknowledged and told. Whether you're here in this hall or watching on land elsewhere, you are on land whose histories and stewardship and accompanying injustices need to be acknowledged. And proper recognition is merely a first step. The place of this lecture, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what we now know as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people, past, present, and future of the Massachusetts tribe for whom the land remains sacred and for and which we honor, recognizing that this demands that we ask, what are our obligations to the land and the many people who have been its stewards and occupants? And we invite you, wherever you view this, to reflect on how foregrounding the stories and perspectives of indigenous inhabitants on the past, present, and future of where you are shifts your understanding of and obligations to the land and people around you. Thank you for the plenitude and fullness of that, Garnet. A quick reminder that um, for our Zoom audience, we have live captioning available. To enable the captions, click the closed captioning button at the bottom of the live stream window. And a shout of thanks to Raquel, Han, Matt, and the entire staff um, who always do great work to make these events successful. I also want to invite you to join us for some upcoming GSD public programs. This is a busy time. I argued with Garnett, like, maybe a little earlier in the semester. <laughs> Garnett said, maybe a little later in the semester. Um, anyway, we, there are events all week long, in spite of it being the last full week of classes uh, of the entire year. Uh, this Friday, uh, April 19th, the fourth annual Mayor's Institute on City Design program concludes its season with a symposium entitled Mayors Imagining the Just City. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor fellows from across the country will discuss strategies for using planning and design interventions to address racial, social, and environmental justice in each of their cities. For more information, you can visit the GSD website. And now for this evening's event. If you'll indulge me for a moment, it feels fitting to me, as this is our last departmental event of the school year, to look back for just a moment at our department lecture series this past fall and spring. In September, we kicked off the year with a very spirited and persuasive talk on the idea of the Sponge City with Kon Jan Yu, also joined on that evening with, by Ann Spurn, who's here tonight. We had the inimitable Katrin Mosbach describe her projects around the world and our own Olmsted lecturer, Anita Beresbetia, share her groundbreaking work on Charles Eliot and the Blue Hills. The spring, Beth Meyer gave the Kylie lecture. I think she's watching tonight, Garnet. Um, and she posited a way of rethinking cultural landscapes as sites of experimentation. And then Laurette Savoy gave a beautiful sonnet that merged personal encounters with black history against a metaphor of geologic violence. That was unforgettable. Tonight will also be unforgettable. You've done us a big favor, closing out the year with your natural warmth and wisdom. Garnet has been on a long journey, 
I don't see it ending anytime soon. He's been walking from Jamaica to New Orleans to New York and then Charlottesville and then, to our benefit, Cambridge. I don't see him flying even to close those distances. I kind of, in my imagination, think he walks the space in between. We might say he's the flaneur of our time, but that doesn't do it justice because it is so much more than that. He's asking us to bring our most self-aware selves to every experience and to pay attention when we walk. This mindset was born of necessity. Walking in Kingston, the capital of Jamaica, was dangerous, especially at night. He explains, and I quote, it was necessary, it was necessity that drove me on the streets, making my way around by foot since I was out until public transportation was no more. I began encountering a variety of people, a variety of characters, a variety of interpreters of the city as I thought of them, and suddenly walking became walking as discovery, as escape, encounter, arrival, rest, walking as a way of becoming more aware of the self, walking as a way to become aware of other selves, walking as a whole world that's hidden from me when I'm making my way from point A to point B via public transportation. Continuing the quote, walking as a black man has made me feel simultaneously more removed from the city in my awareness that I'm perceived as suspect and more closely connected to it in the full attentiveness demanded by my vigilance. It has made me walk more purposefully in the city, becoming part of its flow, rather than observing, standing apart, ending the quote. So less the flaneur, more the attentive participant. He mentions from time to time entering the dream state of Walter Mitty, brandishing the boyish mischief of Tom Sawyer, and regarding the city with the literary frame of people like Melville and Whitman. Carnot releases, re, sorry, relates these stories most famously in the much quoted essay, Walking While Black, by way of asking us to become active listeners, engaging in deeper self-awareness, to bring a conscious self to our engagements with the world. He asks, what self do you bring to the project? What kind of attention are you cultivating? Garnett is the Tunney Lee Distinguished Lecturer in the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. His research focuses on the promise and perils of urban life, the vitality and inequality of cities, and the beauty and challenges of pluralism. His teaching brings together art, architecture, and urban planning to explore and examine perennial and urgent issues of our time, especially the conundrums of public space and the conditions that move towards and retreat from, make us move towards and retreat from public space. And because he has a joint appointment, he has with his charter to honor and follow the capacious spirit of Tunney Lee, who was his friend and generous example, and bring together the departments of architecture and urban studies and planning, that must be a challenging thing, um, <laughs> over shared concerns and goals. An educator who is devoted to the written word Garnett is also an essayist who writes on culture and the arts for a variety of publications. His love for the arts has led to collaborations with artists and musicians, such as How the Spotlight Sounds with Harvard faculty member Vijay Iyer, who's here tonight, featured at The Kitchen in New York. The arts play a central role in his teaching and leisure. In addition to MIT, where he first came as 2017-2018 Martin Luther King Jr. visiting scholar in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. He's taught at Yale University, NYU, and the University of Virginia, where he was the 2021 Harry Porter Jr. Distinguished Professor in the School of Architecture. He's been senior critic at the Sculpture Department at Yale School of Art, visiting fellow, it goes on and on here, um, at the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU, visiting fellow at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale, visiting fellow at the, Gilderman, the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale, visiting fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at the University of Virginia, visiting fellow at the Black Metropolis Research Consortium, and visiting fellow for the Center of Black Music Research. 
the editor-at-large for Nonstop Metropolis, a New York City atlas. He is currently working on a book on walking. For somebody who takes the time to walk, this is a very busy guy. Um, in addition to his walking journey, there's another voyage. He's kind of self-taught his way towards the discipline of landscape architecture. We're happy about that. Garnett is a very generous friend of the Department of Landscape Architecture, and you most often see him here in Gun Hall at Landscape Core and Option Reviews during mid-semester and final reviews, virtually all of our lectures. I joke with him that Nicholas, his chair at DUSP, must be perennially mad at him for skipping all their reviews down the street and coming to ours. <laughs> Maybe we benefit from a little bit of misalignment with schedules, but he's here a lot, and we're grateful for that. And perhaps tonight he'll tell us something about his fascination with the attention we bring to the world. Please welcome Garnet. Let's start what we have come into the room to do. <laughs> right on. Here goes. One, two, three. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> I mean, how do you follow something like that? We can just call it quits now. Fellow start of the day. But exactly. <laughs> but I'm especially grateful to all of you for coming out, given you know the good weather outside. I know I'd be walking, I wouldn't be listening to me. And I'm especially grateful because, I mean, walking. Six years ago, almost to the day, I went to Canada. I was on my way to Banff, you know, with these glorious, beautiful mountains, to do a workshop, you know, with anthropologists, poets, designers, writers of all sorts to think about walking. Get to the airport and being paid, so I have to go through a special line and explain where I came. You know, I'm here to the workshop on walking. The immigration official was excited, like terrific. Said, "Oh, this is great! I love Christopher Walken." <laughs> He's like, "No, walking." He said, "Yeah." So the enjoyment turned to befuddlement, and then he called the supervisor. You know, who then explained that they know how to walk in Canada; they don't need my help. <laughs> Eventually, I made my way through. And the last thing he said to me was, nice work if you can get it. And just hand my papers to me. So in a special thanks uh, to the GSC, to Gary Hildebrand, to Sarah Whiting, to Matt, you know, who's my saving grace, um, to you know, Raquel Rivera, to Han, to all the very many people, and not to mention in the audience, I see so many friends and interlocutors um, and examples, you know, who've enriched this journey moving on. On Memorial Day morning in 2016, I walked into the Confederate Cemetery at the University of Virginia to join a few dozen people who were there to honor the nation's war dead. More precisely, the nation's Confederate dead. I'd been in Charlottesville for less than an academic year. You can tell the academics, they count by academic years. And was regularly confronted by the weight of its history, its street names, its Confederate monuments, its touches of the nation's third, fourth, and fifth presidents, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, the university's academical village, and Monticello, Little Mountain, Jefferson's home and plantation, looking down on it all. I especially wanted to understand why the monuments, normally dead to me, felt so alive to so many. And when my colleague Frank Dukes mentioned a Confederate memorial ceremony, I decided, yeah, I'm down. I had no intention to gawk 
our mock, mind you. Instead, as I entered the cemetery with Frank, who was there too to better understand, I carried Auden's words as my dictum. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. Just in case you think I'm being modest, this is the program from there. You'll see evidence of my crooked heart with the notes I've made. Hosted by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and Sons of Confederate Veterans, the ceremony seemed to be presided over by the spirits of the Confederate past. Facing the center three of us in attendance was a Confederate soldier standing proudly on a plinth. His pride returned by those taking us through a program with greetings that consisted of lines like, I can't say enough of our forefathers and what they stood for. And there are many who would like to remove these symbols, the Confederate symbols. Songs like, Carry Me Back to Old Virginia, and Dixie's Land, and salutes like, I salute the Confederate flag with affection, reverence, and undying remembrance. I kept looking around to connect with an inviting face I could approach at the end of the ceremony, and my glance landed on the only other black person there, a woman who looked regal in her pink blouse and black skirt and black jacket, her crown a splendid black hat with a sumptuous bow. She gave me the nod. I gave it back with a smile, black solidarity in the simplest of gestures. I felt less of an outsider, barely, but it was something. Sorry. Shortly after, the main speaker was introduced, and my partner in solidarity walked to the podium. She smiled at me, I smiled broader. The exchange felt conspiratorial. If only they knew what she was going to say, I told myself they'd have thought twice about inviting her. Then she began. Robert E. Lee freed the slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation freed no one. The document signed by Lee had more force because it had the force of law. Lincoln was trying to take credit for what Lee had done, and so on and so on. As I sat trying to sort through my mix of curiosity and confusion, caught somewhere between what and come again? Actually, just more like what and come again? I couldn't help but think I was witnessing an argument about acknowledgement. The cemetery grounds was more than memoranda. It was a memory battlefield. This felt all the more true after the proceedings when a petite woman with a welcoming smile walked me through the cemetery to tell me about the war of Southern independence, showed me the graves of falling Confederate soldiers. At one moment, looking down on a series of names on a tombstone, she zigged from enthusiasm to something short of rage when discussing those Yankees. And though she spoke of the Civil War as, it, as if it ended the previous week, I had a sense that the flesh of anger didn't come from remembering the conflict. Her fury came not from remembering, I dare to presume, but from how other people chose to remember. As Lucy Clifton remarks in her poem, why, people, why some people be mad at me sometimes, they ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories. And I keep on remembering Mine. As I was about to leave, she insisted that I see one more thing, one more thing, and walked me past the graves of former university presidents and faculty, names I'd seen before in academic buildings, on the main library, and on the main street that veined through the heart of the university, past the edge of the cemetery, past a short north wall that separated an enclosed piece of land from the cemetery. 
She explained that it was a burial ground, a burial ground for African Americans, then looked up with some bewilderment and asked, I wonder why black people don't visit here more. One answer to her question is to say, presence begets presence. Another answer is, borrowing the words of Trio, facts are not created equal. The production of traces is always also the creation of silences. But the best answer I know has been provided by the poet Nate Marshall in his poem, Landless Acknowledgement. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that we live on some unseeded bones. Sometimes me and mine imagine ancestral homes. All I got so far is Montgomery, Alabama. Maybe a boat, maybe a plot of land somewhere so far from the south sides I've claimed that I would get lost on the way. I admit, sometimes my homies talk about their families immigrating and I get jealous. We lost the land we were custodians over before it was a twinkle in the eye of a twinkle in the eye of a twinkle in the eye. Closest I got to homeland is my mother's Caucasian pitch on the phone calling the police. Closest I got to homeland is not never calling the police. Closest I got to homeland is my daddy's laugh in a spades game. Closest I got to homeland is my lover's tongue talking or otherwise. Closest I got to homeland is the funk on the DJ's needle and my hand full of a dance partner. Not to be dark, but I am. Not to be dark, but the planet is on fire. Not to be dark, but they move in capitals because the water is coming up. Not to be dark, but our bones are in that water too. Maybe that's my capital. Once the polar capitals melt and there's a whole lot less land for folks to buy and sell and steal, maybe everybody will feel a little more dark. We'll feel a little more homelandless, like we do. Why do you think I call my compatriots homies? Maybe ain't no home except for how your beloveds cuss or pray or pronounce. And so much of my journey, much of my movement through the world, through landscape, through cities, has been a way of trying to deal with that homelandless, you know, thinking of walking itself as a search for home. I mean, after all, to walk is to begin a story, is to begin to cut a path, is to begin to create possibilities, but also to think of the very mechanics of walking itself and then how walking works, is to also to think about its vulnerabilities, to think about its homelandness. You're walking, and you don't always realize it, but you're always falling. With each step, you fall forward slightly, and then catch yourself from falling. Over and over, you're falling and then catching yourself from falling. And this is how you can be walking and falling at the same time. But we live in a place in which Walking you know, is thought to be an evidence of social failure. I mean, you know, think of Quentin Tarantino's 1994 in the crime drama. I mean, I'm not a Tarantino fan, but you know, he's helpful here. 
<laughs> um, in which you have two gangsters and one had you know, what he sees as a near miracle of his life being saved and decides that you know, the life of a walker you know, guy in his wandering ways, you know, maybe the way to go. What's she gonna do then? Well, that's what I've been sitting here contemplating. First, I'm gonna deliver this case to Marcellus. Then, basically, I'm just gonna walk the earth. What you mean, walk the earth? You know, like Kane in Kung Fu. Walk from place to place, meet people, get in adventures. And how long do you intend to walk the earth? Till God puts me where he wants me to be. And what if you don't do that? If it takes forever, then I'll walk forever. So maybe it's L.A. In, after all, we know the song, you know, the walking in L.A. where it says no one walks in L.A. That we've organized our cities, particularly in the post-war years, especially here in the States, around the automobile. The automobile is king. The automobile is the bully. The automobile defines so much our cityscape um, and also our landscape. But to think about walking, particularly in the context, you know, of landscape, is to think very much about what it means to be imprinted, to find a home. Let's go back to that edge and think of that edge where I saw that African American graveyard. And I think very much of you know, Kevin Lynch's work. Um, I'm from MIT where Kevin Lynch is king. Uh, <laughs> And you know, him thinking about the image of the city, you know, the public image we have of the city, you know, the city with its paths, the city with its edges, uh, the city with its landmarks. But to walk is actually in many ways to discover that there are many cities and to discover the shadow city, you know, as it were. To recognize you know, the edge may very much be the center. You know, and I think, for example, of Alice Knight, you know, that wonderful character in Edward P. Jones's book, The Known World, you know, who you know, was thought of a mad woman walking in the plantation, maybe analogous to the mad woman in the attic, you know, which often are much smarter than all of us. And as she's walking and walking and walking, eventually testing the edges or the boundaries of that plantation, she eventually walks her way into a map, walks her way into freedom. So in other words, you know, to walk in many ways is to begin to find the edges and often to redefine the edges. You know, one thinks of Sixto in Beloved, you know, Sixta, who is, you know, walking to visit the person he's in love with, um, who he calls, you know, sixty-mile woman, um, partially because he has to walk thirty miles each way, you know, and then of course, I mean, talk about a line where he says, "She's a friend of my mind. She gathers me, man. The pieces I am, she gathers them and give them back to me, in all the right order." Walking is about encounter, you know, but walking is also about the act of gathering the pieces together, you know, of probing the edges, of probing the new paths you know, through encounter, but beginning to ask, you know, how might the edges be different? You know, what really are the edges? The edges of that graveyard, of that cemetery, in which there are all these unmarked graves you know, of the enslaved, in a scene from a distance, it becomes a landscape of asymmetry in a, a landscape in which in a, in a, there's clear evidence of the histories and the memories you know, on that landscape. But also to begin to walk it is to begin to imprint one's mark on it, to recognize you know, how much repeated movement through a space, in a repeated inscribing of a space you know, marks into a place. Because walking is a memorial act. We inscribe ourselves onto place by moving through it at a human pace the pace of encounter, and allowing place to inscribe itself onto our memories, onto our imagination. All things are engaged in writing their history, wrote Emerson back in his journal in 1850, and continued, not the footsteps into the snow or along the ground, but prints in characters, more or less lasting, a map of its march, the ground is all memoranda and signatures, and every object covered with hints. What then may be the hints in at the edges? What then may be the hints that are before us? What then may be the hints that we quickly you know, move roughshod over 
you know, moving you know, beyond you know, human pace, moving in, in, a, in our cars, in a self-enclosed, sometimes removed from the beauty and the frustration you know, of human encounter. Let's not you know, forget the frustration. Um, but also, you know, what might we you know, separate ourselves from with, you know, with landscape? To think about landscape and to think about memory, as I was that morning in that day, Confederate uh, memorial ceremony, and to see the ways in which you know, people are thinking about their relationship, you know, you know, what belongs to them, a sense of home versus you know, homelessness or homelessness. And I began, you know, I left there you know, early and started walking around Charlottesville. And it's the way I've always moved and navigated, whether it be Kingston, New York, New Orleans, you know, you know, walking and giving yourself over to places, you know, asking what does it mean to begin to make my signatures, to make my marks, to inscribe myself into the place, to give myself over to the place so I become part of its memory. I become part of the way it layers and thinks of itself. But also, what does it mean to move and to also think of you know, the ways people are not walking or not moving? That a place is important not merely for how you can move in a place, but what it tells you about how people don't move, how they don't walk, the ways in which they're not embodied. So before going to Charlottesville, of course, in a coming to the US, I'd been in Jamaica, where it's a majority black country, in the U, think of street smarts being a way of calibrating yourself to you know, your sense of danger. But then having a quixotic task after I'd come here and been here long enough to recognize that, ah, there's also the task of trying to calibrate yourself to other people's fear of you. And so what then might it mean to think of having the shade of trespass? You know, how does that affect how you see yourself inscribed into a place? And how does that affect both presence and also absence? As I said, presence begets presence. And so walking around Charlottesville, you know, looking to see, again, why don't more people come here? A question you know, she had asked. In a question I wanted to take Seriously, you know, remembering Wislawa Simbroska's reflections, looking at the 20th century and thinking about the kind of promise that the 20th century held, but how given our, to our war selves, you know, all this promise of technology and better in devolved into war and degrading each other. And at the end, after you know, recounting all the horrors of the 20th century, she said, how should we live? Someone asked me in a letter. I had meant to ask him the same question. Again, and as ever, the most pressing questions are naive questions. So I'm inviting you to like, think along with tonight with some naive questions. You know, the simple naive questions are like, what might it mean to think of being embodied? You know, how about the simple, seemingly mundane task you know, of moving at human pace, you know, of encounter? What does it mean to begin to look at our edges and ask, you know, are they truly edges? You know, are there places in which people do gather? Like, you know, the plantation, uh, you know, we see in, in the known world, in Edward Jones' known world, and see how they gather and begin to redefine, remap, reconfigure, rethink, reimagine the space before them and as an extension of themselves. You know, how might we look at, say, Lynch and begin to ask, you know, are there other cities? Are there other cities that are equally public, but still on the scene, on the explored, on the examine? You know, ways of seeing, ways of reading the city. And so, what might it mean to go back again and look at memory and to think you know, of memory and memorials? And I think of the enslaved laborers at the University of Virginia, where when I went trying to see the kind of contributions they made to the city, walking around the city, what, what was to be found was a small plaque on the foot, barely seen, barely acknowledged, and also choosing just the right date to make the enormity of the contribution that they had to the university, but also the severity of the exploitation seem less. And then eventually, you know, came the memorial for the enslaved laborers. And after years of thinking and asking, what might it mean to acknowledge those who are an important part of this landscape, who shaped this landscape, who built this landscape, you know, who are a significant part of it? 
This, by the way, is what I call receipts. Right here. That's a program in case people are wondering if it was like a fantastic story or fiction. But here, the memoir for the enslaved laborers. In a bringing with it, in a, in a rich palimpsest, you, know, you see the diameter you know, of the memorial, the same as the diameter of the rotunda. You see in the height of the highest walls, the same as the serpentine walls, which is a way of hiding the presence you know, of the enslaved laborers who were you know, helping to you know, create and build and serve the academical village and the lawn, the legendary lawn, the beautiful lawn of the University of Virginia um, built on that label. But the important part of this and in looking at in, in the presence is how it's on the edge. If you could see in the photograph on the right, it's on the edge of the campus. And so seen from the perspective of the campus, it's the edge. But seen from the perspective of the descendants of the enslaved living in the city, seen from the perspective you know, of those in a, in a scene, in a, you know, what the camp, what the university is like and where gatherings are happening, you know, where people are assembling, where people making formations and life you know, around their routines, around their habits, around their sensibility. It is very much the center. And to then walk and to walk it and to begin to ask, what does it mean to actually you know, think about you know, that being a part, you know, the beauty of it being right by a path? But what's especially important, at least for me, is how this becomes a part of you by the continual movement through it, the continual walking through it. And to think also of the beauty of the palimpsest, of having that story you know, underlaid or over. I know that I can hardly come to a review, not here anywhere, without hearing palimpsest at least a dozen times. But I want to suggest in you know, a rich kind of palimpsest that I think may have been underexplored. Um, and a palimpsest which we access very much through walking. Before I continue, I should actually qualify and say, when I say walking, I'm trying to use it expansively. Um, and actually, I shouldn't, I'm not trying to use it expansively. I, when I say walking, it's important to think about it walking in a, at a human pace, in a, a pace, human pace of encounter. So in other words, in a, being in a wheelchair, I've, you know, a lot of people who are in you know, a disabled said, oh, let's go on a walk together. You know, for them, you know, you know, walking is moving at a human pace. So when I say walking, yes, um, and I'm thinking of legs myself, but I'm also thinking of walking in you know, a much more expensive of like, what does it mean to move through the world at human pace, the pace of encounter? And so to walk, yes, it's to inscribe yourself onto a place and have it inscribed onto you, but it's also to actually have a particular map inscribed you know, onto you. I'm going to give the polite paraphrase of this meme that went around a couple of years ago, where it said, New York City. And then underneath it, it was the grid that says, because we wanted to get where you're going. Then it says, Boston. And there's the serpentine highways, the cul-de-sacs. And then underneath it said, this is the family-friendly version, because forget you. <laughs> What that really is, is a New Yorker's vision of Boston, in a, a sense that the city is an affront to you because you've sorted very much in, a, in a, the map of the previous place you were on you. The grid with its impatience, with its intolerance for clots, uh, with its hurriedness, somehow doesn't know how to you know, respond to the cul-de-sacs and the serpentine highways. But even more than that, it's a way of in allowing in a, the lower, in a more faded print imprints of the palimpsest to become so dominant. So one of the beauties of walking is that places speak to places. There are questions raised by that cemetery that was at that will not be answered by that cemetery. There are questions that I have there that only begins to get answered when I'm walking through in a Pelham Parkway in the Bronx. There are questions that the Bronx raised that I don't have answered until I'm in the south side of Chicago. There are things that the south side of Chicago is asking me that George Chester answers you know, incredibly well. So in other words, there's a palimpsest that is happening through the memory, through the imagination, that only happens through and by way of walking. And so we have a tendency to, as it were, you know, walk to think, you know, walking is important to field work. It's the next methodology, it's the next toolbox. I mean, 
I don't think I've given the double nine yet, so they may decide that they're not going to pay me, you know, to say, I'm going to come and say, walking isn't good for you. But the truth is, if walking was bad for you, I still would be doing it. I don't want to give you a next, in an in a eat your vegetables or another thing for your toolbox. What I want to say, as important as walking is, you know, what especially rich you know, about walking, you know, in a, yes, the human encounter, but also on what it does to the imagination. You know, what it does to put us in conversation with the poets, yes, in conversation with the novelists, yes, but especially in conversation, you know, with us in you know, and the landscape. You know, what it does for us to begin to see the palimpsest differently, to start recognizing that there are questions being raised you know, you know, by us, you know, you know, by the urban fabric, by landscape, by the built environment, that many times get answered you know, by our movement, our inscribing, or the inscription of other places onto us as we're elsewhere. So yes, we walk to have a richer sense of self and a richer sense of others, but we walk in an understanding that's a long-standing, ongoing story, that the writing is going, that the palimpsest is going, not merely in the places that we're looking at. So as beautiful as this palimpsest is, with the memorial for enslaved laborers with Virginia, and part of its beauty coming from the adjoinment, that you know, the proximity to the things that it's referring to. You know, think again, you know, you know, what it means to encounter that with a palimpsest in your imagination. The palimpsest of seeing this or encountering this after encountering the Confederate cemetery in a, and the abandon, or seemingly abandoned, that's, that's an unfair word, because um, I know the university have been making steps um, to memorialize that African-American cemetery. But what it means is to see them in juxtaposition with each other and to begin to ask, you know, how can place speak to place? You know, what does it mean to actually begin to think of recognition or the kind of misrecognitions that happen that I speak of? But the different ways of inhabiting a place and the different ways of inhabiting a place that comes from that palimpsest that we have in our imagination. So in other words, there are ways in which I resist a place because of my previous experiences, my previous encounter in a weird landscape, you know, or with, in a particular urban formation, or in a particular in a social element. And I say all of this, you know, leaving from Charlottesville and making my way to Cambridge, you know, you know, wanting us to think very much about in memory and memorials. You know, we're in a city that very much, you know, bears some strong similarities to Charlottesville, though people may not see it. You know, in Charlottesville, as in Cambridge, there are company towns, and the company is the university. And so what it means then to be in that company town, what it means to, to think through our interactions with each other, and, but also to you know, begin to ask, what might it mean to have those you know, campuses? What does it mean to have our landscapes, ones in which people are inscribing themselves onto it, and we're also inscribing ourselves onto their imagination, onto their memories in the right way? I say that thinking also you know, of the work that's being done in to think of a memorial here um, for the legacy of slavery. Uh, like well, Bob was jumping right in the middle. Yes, and so there is In it, in it, there's that RFQ, um, and us thinking, you know, how do we memorialize and think about the memories, you know, um, legacy of slavery in a here and also in Cambridge itself. You know, how do we, you know, begin to think in, a, in light of the homelessness that others may feel, or the homelessness? How do we begin to think of how to, you know, remap? The space that made more sense to people in our own particular routines they have, in a, in a how people you know remap and redefine themselves, in a how you know their palimpsests you know that are in them, in a, in a becomes an important part of it, but also in what it means to see people in all their full capacities and their capaciousness and heterogeneity. That walking allows a kind of granular encounter. Walking allows you know, a kind of 
association with dissonance that allows, that invites, that encourages, if we give ourselves over to it, to see people in, their, in, a, in a rich heterogeneity. I say that knowing also that as we think about memory and memorials and the legacies of things that have been done, there is sometimes a tendency for us, particularly around thinking about memory and landscape, to see people as the sum total of their tragedies, to think of, as it were, the tragic lives that have you know, come their way. And so part of it then means thinking of walking as a rich way of seeing, thinking of our encounters as a way of asking the naive questions about people, thinking of what it means to search and to find what the poet Dennis Smith calls dinosaurs in the hood, where he says, I heard a laughter, you know. Let's make a movie called Dinosaurs in the Hood. Jurassic Park meets Friday meets the pursuit of happiness. There should be a scene where a little black boy is playing with a toy dinosaur on the bus, then looks out the window and sees a T-Rex, because there has to be a T-Rex. Don't let Tarantino direct this. In his version, the boy plays with a gun. The metaphor, black boys toy with their own lives, the foreshadow to his end, the spitting image of his father. Forget that, the kid is a plastic brontosaurus or triceratops. You have no idea how often I pronounce this. And this is his proof of magic or God or Santa. But then he ends with the last stanza, going through and this, in asking, what might it mean to see the people you encounter as more than the sum total of their tragedies? What might it mean as we're thinking about memorials, as we're thinking about places of memory, of recognizing among the most important thing we have you know, is not the symbolic in as much as the social. You know, how then you know, do we invite, you know, do we design, do we you know, um, create you know, you know, the rich ground, literally and metaphorically, for people to begin you know, to start to move around and to think about the social, to want to inscribe themselves on the place and the place inscribed unto them. You know, and he says, no chicken jokes in this movie, no bullets in the heroes, and no one kills a black boy. And no one kills a black boy. And no one kills the black boy. Besides, the only reason I want to make this is for that first scene anyway. The little black boy on the bus with a toy dinosaur, his eyes wide and endless. His dreams possible, pulsing, and right there. So in walking, I try to look for the dinosaur on the bus. In thinking about memorials, I ask, what might it mean to create a kind of environment in which we're continually seeing the dinosaur on the bus, in which we see tragedy, yes, but it doesn't define people. We see possibility, we see improvisation, we see ambition, we see joy, we see beauty. We see, you know, as my friend, Sarah Hendren continually reminds us, and I know she's in the audience, sorry for embarrassing you. You know, you know, we see wonder along with urgency. We do not drown in urgency at the expense of wonder, at the expense of awe. We allow the edges and the paths and the landmarks to be defined or redefined or remapped around people's routines around people's habits and sensibility, around the world that is known, the known world. And how does one know this world? You know, how does one make sense of this world? You know, how does one turn a space into a place? You know, how does one find solidarity, find friendship, find attachment, find meaning? 
you know, how does one give themselves over to others and richly expanding that sense of self? While if we're fortunate, also call people's best selves. So a space, a memorial space, a space should be a space where we not only come and see difference, we not only see what has happened to others, but it's a space in which we, by encountering, by moving alongside, by seeing people in their you know, rich multiplicities, can begin to ask, can begin to think, can begin to work towards seeing how do we contain each other? And thinking of how do we contain each other, what then are our obligations? It's for this reason that I'm partially suspicious, well, it's more than partially, but I don't sound like a sociopath, about empathy, about empathy as a goal. Um, because it feels very much like the cousin of guilt. Um, and guilt, as I keep reminding people, is not a design tool. And so what then to think about empathy, and so often the focus on the need to connect, or the desire to connect. But the dangers of that is that it opens up to presumption, to thinking, the point is to put myself in your shoe, to experience what you feel, to know what you feel, when sometimes the very purpose of a memorial is to point out a chasm, a gulf, that we will never know, we will never understand. But not knowing, in light of that, what then are our obligations? What then are our responsibilities? So to walk, yes, is to register, is to register our presence, is to register other people's presence, is to register and to start begin to uncover the layers upon layers upon layers of histories and memories and stories that are in any space that we inhabit or hope to inhabit or we pass through, or places that people are refusing to inhabit for some of those various stories. But it's also to think about responsibility, to think about what we owe each other, you know, what, how we contain each other, what are obligations in light of what we know, you know, or should know, you know, or could know. So then to then come back and ask, what does it mean then to walk through the space here? Uh, what does it mean to begin to move through the cityscape um, and you know, move through it with freedom, but also sometimes to move through it with some set of defiance? So that's him walking from street to street, first, second, third, fourth, uh, but also walking in spaces that are liminal. So to walk is to discover those liminal spaces. But to walk also is to put yourself in places of serendipity, you know, of recognizing you know, what it means to you know, give ourselves over to others, to, as it were, not be in control. You know, in the car, you listen to Taylor Swift, you have your potpourri, it's all yours, it's control. But to walk is to then subject yourself to sounds, to smells, to sights that you may want to see, and then to ask then, you know, what claims does this have on me? And therefore, what responsibilities does this invite? What obligations does it invite? I've been speaking about it as if it's merely you know, something about the past, that walking is in memory. Oh, you inscribe yourself onto memory. You allow a place to inscribe itself onto you. You inscribe yourself onto it. But walking is also very much future-oriented. Maybe it's because I'm such a fan of you know, the TV show Atlanta, you know, and it's continual representation of what it means to think about you know, the absurdity of life, absurdity of black life from time and time again. Um, it's often praised for being Afro-surrealism, but I think part of the power of it, which is part of why I had to spend some time in that cemetery at the beginning, 
is to walk, to give yourself over to things, to others, is to put yourself in touch with the absurdity of the real. You know, for all our data and all our measurement, we can speak about just the, you know, the horrors of what is happening with climate change. But few things put in touch with that as feeling 75 degrees on Christmas Eve in New England, or feeling 120 degrees in a, on what's supposed to be a nice spring day in Phoenix. That there is an experience of the absurdity of the real. And so we can begin to start thinking about what might alternate futures be. And I think of that term, solastalgia, in the lament for a lost future, as opposed to you know, nostalgia, the, lam the lament you know, for a lost past. So if we began you know, with nostalgia in the cemetery, we ought to end thinking about solastalgia. You know, what world is coming? What world in a, in a, do we have now? What world do we want to bequeath? And then how might we begin to act in a different ways to be, in a, in a, as you know, the climate activists rightly you know, remind us time and again, to be better ancestors. And I dare say something as simple and seemingly mundane you know, as walking, as giving yourself over to others, as inscribing yourself into a place and allowing it to inscribe itself to you, and allowing it to inscribe you, you know, as being ready to be open to serendipity, to examine the silences, to uncover the hidden, to run in the direction of possibility, to search for dinosaurs in the hood, to ask not merely you know, who is there but who is not there and why, will allow us to, as Seema Sini say, detect in the urban and in our landscape a music that you would never have known to listen for. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful talk. Um, we all work around 90 miles an hour around here, especially as the end of the semester approaches. I had, I think, maybe at least 10 meetings today. <laughs> and you put, you put us in a mood that slows down the pace of encounter. Is that a generous way of saying you were falling asleep? <laughs> no. Did I look like I was? I, that's because I'm jet lagged. <laughs> um, you know, you're opening. Um, Your opening um, discussion of Confederate Memorial Day, I couldn't not think of Clint Smith's book, How the Word is Passed, and it seems astonishing still. I mean, I think I read that book three years ago, but um, it seems astonishing that, that that's still being celebrated. I just have to say that. Um, I remember when I was going, I got an email from Beth who said, is it true you're go I can't, Beth, <laughs> forgive me for misquoting you. I mm -hmm. actually looked at the email yesterday just to memorize it. But I remember Beth saying, are you, are going, you going there? <laughs> really? Yeah, are you going with Frank? Frank Dukes, who by the way, was one of the people on the design team for the Memorial for Enslaved Laborers. So he's also somebody who um, is a wonderful example of you know, how to talk to people um, and our obligation to also interact mm -hmm. um, with people, you know, who hold beliefs and sensibilities vastly different from others, from ours. Well, that's what I wanted to get to. In fact, um, your invocation of someone in a wheelchair said to me that it is, it is, in some ways, you have to tell me if I'm not right about this. It's less walking and more the pace of encounter. Right. It's, the walking maybe is is a vehicle. 
but the thing, the experience that you're after, the sensibility that you're after is, is about a pace. Which is part of my fight with the Flaneur tradition and yes. even to some extent the, the psychogeography. And, I'm, and actually, I sometimes think of architecture in terms of, I said, is this inviting me to be a Flaneur or a participant? So is this a symbolism that I should view from afar and thought, oh, you know, I've seen that or I've, you know, I've gone there, now I'm done, you know, the task is done. Or, you know, there's a memorial, you know, this chastising sensibility said, you see what you've done? Uh, this is what you, you know, what you did. And then you've left and said, okay, you know, you know, dealt with the guilt of, you know, shaking it off, I'll never do that again. You know, as opposed to, yeah. you know, the, the, the human, um, the human pace, that in the pace of encounter then invites multiple encounters. It, it, it also in you know, insists that you can know only so much, uh, you know, from in a in a quick or brief encounter. There, yes, in a in a I'm a lover, for example, of in you know, a public transit because and what we call third spaces. I don't know people are sick and tired of hearing that term, um, but the way it encourages incidental yet meaningful encounters, you know, at the bodega, in the coffee shop, in in a in a public uh, park. But you know what is you know, especially you know, important is giving yourself over to others, and also allowing others to give themselves over to you. That it's you know, very much a you know, democratic task, um, but it's also in a way of growing our humanity and acknowledging and recognizing in each other's humanity. So fundamentally what I'm thinking about when I think about walking is, what's the task of acknowledgement, which is one of the reasons um, it wasn't a criticism of the you know, GSTs in acknowledgement, but it's also sometimes you have to alter form because you want people not to begin to like not pay attention. And so sometimes in you know, a shift in language or a shift in structure or you know, to thank you know, after in a story about going to Canada rather than thanking at the beginning, you know, forces people not to fall into the habit of not listening. So it's it's encounter, which is an encounter that allows an acknowledgement, that allows recognition, and maybe, maybe if we're fortunate, call to our better selves or call out our better selves. Most of you here have heard that acknowledgement, you know, just dozens and dozens of times, but it sounded different tonight. Really, thank you for that. Um, at the UVA Memorial, um, I'm familiar with the criticism about it being at the edge of campus. I would defend this choice in a way. I don't know if you can agree. There's two things about walking and that memorial. One is um, that it is encountered by just about everyone who goes you know, to the street, to the corner, right? So that's very purposeful, I think. But then there is also, and it kisses the path, right? So you, you, you can never not at least encounter it. And then walking th around it and through it, as you said, slows the pace and allows you um, to consider, to regard. I think the position is also important in saying it stands at the crux of two different ways, um, two, in, a, in a variety of ways of seeing that the descendant community, you know, said the lawn and academical village doesn't hold the place. It's, it's not, you know, to think of, say, in a Kevin Lynch's term, it's not a landmark for us, say, you know, the way it is for you. It's not part of our public you know, image of the city. Um, but I think one of the beauties of it also, it, you know, in, along with saying this is how it's seen, you know, from the in the campus on the edge of campus, from the community, it may not be seen as the edge. Yes, um, maybe seen as the center. But the other thing is, it's also saying that maybe there is a distance to go, um, you know, from the edge to the center of campus. Like, what would the university you know, have to do? What changes would have to be made, you know, before you know there is something in you know, at the center, which is in you know, at once symbolic, but also in a social. So in other words, to put it at the center of the lawn may make it, some people say, oh, it's a symbolic success, but a social failure. Mm. 
Um, but where it is now, I think it's both a symbolic and in a symbolic and a social interact and intersect in it beautifully. And it also declares that something has to happen. There are changes that need to be made in the, in the city, in, at the university, that brings it in a closer. Also, it's in a context in which you have quite a few fraternity houses in which you're seeing the Greek letters. And so the culture of hiddenness, you know, to go to Monticello, to look at the lawn and its architecture, is to see an architecture of hiddenness, an architecture of you know, erasure, you know, you know, those walls in an in a extended high, they're shorter now, but the memorial still holds, in, as it were, in a, the older receipts, uh, which was meant to hide the presence or in, in, a, in a view in the presence of slaves. So said, we would like to benefit from the labor, but we would not like to see and have to confront the immorality of what it is that we're doing. And you see it with Lazy Susans in, in, in Monticello, like just in the whole, you know, the engineering and the architecture um, you know, for slavery. And so what this does is to say, you know, surrounded by in you know, a whole atmosphere of hiddenness, this is going to be in the open. So for example, it was supposed to have quite a bit of trees surrounded it, these beautiful trees. And the descendant committee said, no, that you know, there's enough of a culture of hiddenness, a culture of secrecy here. And again, I think you know, it's also, it says something you know, at, with a university, to push a university you know, towards a place of greater openness you know, in our transparency. Um, let's go to the, the very brave thing you did by putting the Harvard RFP up there. <laughs> um, as an empathy skeptic. You or me? You. <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm coming to your side, but um, I think it's powerful that you say that um, maybe this memorial shouldn't um, say, well, I understand what it's like to be in your shoes, but rather face the chasm. Can you say more about that? Yes. I used to have such a good memory for all the young students in the audience, this is, I'm your future. Um, it doesn't last forever. <laughs> I had, Talk about memory yes. a lot, but it fades. <laughs> um, I was trying to remember this Bell Hooks um, quote, which I used to remember so well, where she spoke about the presumption um, that can come you know, with a language around empathy. Um, I mean, in, a, in a, an instance, um, you know, I have dear friends, uh, you know, who are disabled, who, you know, people continually say to them, and I think, well, I don't think, I know, you know, I'm trying to make myself look better, but I know I've also been guilty of, you know, before I became, you know, the empathy skeptic of saying, you know, part of my task was to try to put myself um, in your shoe. It's hard to but, do that, yeah. You know, the presumption is that no matter how much I try, I will never understand, you know, what it's like. But also, what it says, is your claims on me you know, is anchored in identification. I should be able to dislike you and also recognize that I have responsibilities and obligations to you. That civic you know, attachment or civic virtue should not be reliant on whether I can identify with you. And it's actually part of our problem, you know, beyond design, it's, it's a huge problem in what we're facing in our politics, in governance, in so many things in which, you know, them, us. You know, and so you have to show that you're part of the tribe or show elements of the tribe. You know, or for example, uh, you know, I speak about, you know, having the color of trespass, but, you know, the problem of, you know, either being too visible for the wrong reasons or not visible enough. Just, I mean, not just about like every woman in here knows that experience. And I've had multiple friends who've spoken to me and said, oh, this is your experience being somebody who's black. This is my experience being somebody who's a woman. And even though there are intersections, I will never, ever, ever, ever be able to understand it, even though I've heard it thousands of times, what it feels like to be a woman who's arrested. And to then pretend like, oh, I understand because of my experience is presumptuous, but it's, I think it's you know, also offensive. Um, to put it mildly, you know, you know, my obligations, you know, you know, does not rely on me knowing how you feel. My obligations is like, you know, these, you know, you know, are this, you know, 
you know, standards are, you know, you know, these are, you know, this is the moral framework or the web, you know, with which we're supposed to, um, you know, function. And these are ways of thinking about accountability, you know, of thinking about safety, of thinking about uh, our responsibilities, uh, you know, to each other. Uh, and so, in other words, care ought to be divorced, I think, from this, you know, deep, fo you know, deep, you know, in um, you know, a focus, um, I think a misplaced focus on trying to find ways of identifying our identification. I think our first question should be like, what, what do I owe you? What are your claims on me? Uh, what are my obligations to you? You know, you know what, what do you owe me? What do I owe you? And how do we begin to actually negotiate and you know, think about what it means? You know, how do we coexist? Which is part of what Walk you know, is saying. It's, it's in about you know, the coexistence, the declaration of the coexistence, and also a declaration of our mutual possibility, the act of you know, creating paths of moving forward of possibility, but also our mutual um, vulnerability. That the very mechanics itself has a you know, metaphor built into it to say, you know, we're always falling while we're walking. And so then understanding that we're all you know, in a frail, finite beings we're all bounded by in infinitude you know what then um you know you know do we owe each other how then do we live together i hope some of the designers are listening because you've given a good frame for a way of approaching this important problem ahead of us i want to open it up to questions please please wait for the mic Hello, Garnet. Uh, it's a pleasure to listen to you again. Um, I have, uh, I admire your sense of humor, and which I have observed over uh, conversations that we have had uh, previously. Um, you just tell my students to think I only tell grandpa jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm keen to. Um, it's not a question. It's more like I'm wondering, as if. Is there a relationship between humor and walking and the way you joke and the way I mean I I uh, I miss joking the way that I do in Bombay uh, here and the way I walk in Bombay is also different than, than the way I walk here so I I just want to open up whether you have any thoughts on that I do, um, as somebody who is full of grandpa jokes. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, wit is an admission, you know, wit is a next way of, admi in a, in a, of not, as I say, you know, in a, um, channeling Dennis Smith, you know, you know, my search for dinosaurs in the hood. You know, what that does is say that we're not the sum total of the awful things that have happened to us. We're much more than the sum total, you know, you know of, or tragedies of our anger. It's again why I was able to speak to, you know, and and continue to be in conversation with women who, at one minute, you know, was so angry. I thought, oh man, it's 1844. Like, you know, this war just ended. Um, you know, and then at the next minute, she said, oh, let me take you. You have to see this. I think you're going to be interested in this. To understand that that people are, you know, capable of, you know, beauty as well as they're capable of, you know, of horror. And so, you know, how then do you, you know, find a way of actually mediating or to, you know, to, to, to deal with both? Or, all, you know, the old saying, like, you know, you can cry or you can laugh, you know, and, you know, and wit is a way to access, you know, important parts of our humanity, you know, you know that, as it were, you know, needs to be opened up, that actually almost, you know, needs, you know, you know that assistant. Um, to, to have you more fully or more richly realize other things. So I think, for example, wonder, you know, you know requires a certain sense of humor, you know, in an ability to improvise and to see life and to you know, adjust in, a, in, in ways and to you know, begin to ask you know, in a how to adjust rather than in a, in a seal, you know, life as the Boston Highway, you know, as the New York is doing. So part of you know, what wit does, it allows a kind of flexibility in mapping, as I say, you know, with our emotions. It allows us to begin to you know, you know, have a, you know, a rich openness, um, in an improvisatory in a, in a mood or a sensibility. Um, it gives us the chance to also 
in a, in a bit, bit cautious in how we you know, are quick to draw conclusions that in a, in a, in a given people the benefit of the doubt or you know, if this is how, you know, how they truly are, I said, well, maybe they had a bad day or maybe they had a bad life or maybe they just have a bad personality. Um, <laughs> I said, you know, but, <laughs> you know, yes, you know, but you know, there are ways of you know, you know, responding um, that, that wit allows or opens up a, in a generosity and allows you know, other in, you know, in a rich, important valences to come closer to the fore. I think I'm giving that a really bad one. I think the best way to talk about wit is like, is to talk about it with absence. There are friends of mine, you know, sadly, who, you know, you know, who have died. And I think along with them, important aspects of me and other people have gone. That there are elements of me that only appeared to the surface in the presence of them. And so now they're gone, there, there's a quality of laughter I have, or a quality of curiosity, you know, or sometimes even a quality of anger, which doesn't occur anymore because they're no longer there. And I think wit is that, that particular friend, that you know, there are things about generosity, you know, openness, warmth, wisdom, I'm on the W's today, you know, that, that emerge in ways that they won't you know, unless the presence of wit is there. It's a particular catalyst to you know, the opening of the richness you know, and, and you know, increasing the amplitude of other important you know, aspects of our being and others also too. Our dean has a question. So that was extremely beautiful because you actually performed a long walk where there were moments where you hit your stride, there were moments when you circled back on yourself, there were moments when you had a long stoplight, um, and, and, and I found that actually quite beautiful. What I wanted to ask you about is the solitary aspect of walking, because much as you emphasize encounter, um, I'm a big walker, and, and I actually find that walking is an incredibly solitary enterprise. I, I do try to encounter the very cute dogs that I meet or the people even walking them, but very rarely do you achieve an encounter because what was the bubble of the car now is the bubble of people in their own heads with their earphones. And so I think walking has always been solitary, but I think it's ever more so now. And I wonder if you could maybe elaborate on the possibility of humanity with the encounter given the solitariness of walking. One of the reasons I leaned in so hard on encounter was because I, you know, so many who walk, it it comes naturally to be doing the solitary walking, and there's a long tradition, you know, in writing, um, in art practice, um, in in walking as methodology, that insists on walking as solitary. That doesn't focus enough on the encounter, and how important the encounter is for how place makes its mark on us, but how we leave our mark in place, but also in how important encounter is for our expansion of ourself um, and for others. Um, you know, encounter is a way of learning. But I also think you know, it's especially important for what it does for solitary walking, that you know, it's the moments in which you know, we're, you know, we've you know, retreated from the crowd and we've suddenly begun to turn over in our heads you know, why that question? We've begun to ask the naive questions to use in a Simbroska's in a remark. Said, oh, you know, the most pressing questions are the naive ones. You know, just had a conversation, you know, with Sarah and and then also, especially, you know, we've all had it. You had a fight and you have the perfect answer at four o'clock in the morning, three days later. I'm like, <laughs> that's what I should have said. You know, and knew and knew had the perfect comeback. The perfect comeback is always four days later. Uh, and so in a in a this solitary walk in in a, in a solitude is in a, incredibly important for in a, our ability in a, in a, I mean, it's in, I mean I'm going to use in a, in, a, in an old fashioned word but it's never out of date for wisdom in a, the ability to pull back to reflect uh, to meditate to, to turn things over and to actually you know begin to examine that palim says to to begin to say what's the grid that I have you know I just had a you know what, you know what felt like two different maps you know, fighting with each other. You know, how do I pull back and look at what that was and to ask, is there something about a map that I'm carrying? You know, ways of seeing, you know, ways of being in the world, ways of um, you know, embodiment. 
that you know you know that deserves reflection, and that can only be done, I think, by, by a solitary walk. And there's something about the act of you know you know being physical, or physical beings. I you know you know, you know think about the relationship, for example, between walking, you know, and physical activity. I mean, between writing and physical activity. You know, and so you know you're writing and you're like, okay, I can't think. I need to walk or garden. Um, or organize or sharpen pencils. I don't knock the people sharpening pencils. I think these are important parts of procrastination. You know, to do something physical and to remind yourself that you're embodied and the act of you know beginning to move in you know, that routine, the body in a, in a routinized fashion, as it were, sort of you know, allows the brain to start opening up. The neuroscientists have better ways of and more cogent ways of explaining it than I do. But I think the way to actually make the case often for in the solitary walk-in in a, is in a, a peak of encounter. But a way to also make the case of encounter is to you know, remind people of the ends to which they go, um, the ways in which they're not processing, you know, not, not seen, not having a chance to you know, you know, have you know, self-reflection you know, or self-examination you know, because of you know, you know, that removal or isolation from each other. And I think of it particularly you know, after the pandemic when we recognize how much more like how hungry we were for the presence of others. Though a few people were like, can this pandemic be a little bit longer? And I'm like in the alone time. Um, in a, in a, but it suddenly in a, in a had us in a thinking very hard about you know, the beauty you know, of being in a, around others and then how then to invite that uh, kind of encounter. No, no. And many times, it's even better if it's not a one-to-one -one exchange. You know, I think to see the you know rich varieties, um, you know, you know, of humanity. And I'm also thinking, and I think this is maybe a failing of the talk. Um, in a, that, in a, I spoke of it only as if it's encounter with in a, in other people. There is you know this rich encounter you know with the world in all its living multiplicities. You know, what does it mean to have an encounter? Um, you know, you know, you know, you know, landscape. You know, with insects. With what does it mean? You know, for example, to keep having a particular mulberry tree that actually imprints itself into your sense. You know, of you know who you are, and then when it's about to be removed, you know, you suddenly say, no, but this is where you know this person you know in a in a played, and this person got married, and you know this person broke up, um, and then this person came back, um, you know, to be consoled, and 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 suddenly. You know, it becomes an important part you know, you know, of one's memory, of one's emotions, of one's indexing themselves to place. And so in thinking about encounter, I want to speak of it as you know, beyond just, you know, I'm, you know, I'm with friends or I'm you know, with potential enemies, um, <laughs> but also with in, in, a, in a the living world in all its multiplicity and variety and variousness. Okay, we have time for one more question. Well, I'd love to ask a question. All right, <laughs> uh, thanks, Garnet. Um, I'm Vijay, everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you probably know what I'm going to ask. You closed with that line about about um, Seamus Heaney's line about. Um, the music in the landscape. And that's an expansive way to end, and I think that it opens up all of our imagination. Um, I wonder if you could say from your perspective what that is, because I don't think it's about sound. I don't even think it's about listening. So what is it? Sound and listening. <laughs> I'm teasing you. I'm teasing. <laughs> I think Sound and listening is part of it, but what do I mean by listening? Um, in a, in a, my, you know, registering merely how people are, you know, making their mark. Um, you know, or is listening in a way of asking, you know, what does it mean to, you know, begin to identify how people are embodied, or things are embodied? How do, you know how they you know register themselves in the world? Um, you know how, you know what my responsibilities are in respect to that, or that 
third part, if you notice, I didn't say much about reenchantment, though the subtitle of it promised that because I just don't want to get into fights with barbarians, you know, and this reenchantment. <laughs> but but what it means to think, you know, uh, you know, you know, of enchantment. And so it's to listen then um you know, as a way of a prelude to relationship, a prelude to um being together to coexist in in a, in a prelude and so in listening then is sometimes in a, trying to observe in a, how people are making their mark or imprint on you but listening sometimes means sometimes not even looking in a beforehand to begin to ask what are the ways in which i'm inclined not to accommodate not to open not to embrace not the welcome. So in other words, it's very much about presence. In a, in a, in a, whether it be his sound, whether it be in a listening, whether it be in a, in a, the full multisensory, in a, um, in a possibilities available to us, available to us. That what it fundamentally is for me, and to think about like music, and landscape, um, and the particular rhythms, in a, that it could give. In a think of say a tribe called Quest. Um, is it Footfalls? The name of that song. Where they speak about the particular rhythm, you know, with which you're, you know, in a moving through the world, and then how that particular rhythm, you know, calls, you know, you know, you know, or beckons other rhythms out of other people, but you know, all of that is very much in about registering presence, your presence and other people's presence, you know, asking how it can be along a vector of care rather than disruptive. It means turning our attention back to how we began and to ask what does it mean to think about stewardship what does it mean to think about you know, the histories and memories what does it mean to think of presence and not think of indigenous presence as oh something of the past or even the past and the present but you know what might they have to say about how we think about the future and how we move forward what does it mean to understand our presence as being bound up with their presence and so in other words walking is a way to make yourself alert and alive to the presence of others, while also properly you know, questioning and self-questioning your own presence and asking, what kind of presence are you in the world? And what kind of presence might you become in the world through this constant encounter? Thank you all for being here tonight. Garnett, thank you for your regular and constant presence and for this encounter. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>